Opponent, even if it be so, what does it amount to? Vedantin, the answer is that if it be a part, then since the whole, Brahman, is a goal ever attained by that part, there can be no such thing as going to Brahman. Moreover, since Brahman is well known to be partless, it is improper to imagine such things in Brahman as a part and a whole. The position is the same even in case the soul be a transformation, for the transformed thing is ever present in the material of which it is a transformation. An earthen pot can never exist unless it be an identity with the earth, for it will cease to exist when it is not so identified. Again, even if the soul be either an effect or a part of Brahman, then since Brahman, the possessor of such transformations or parts, remains unchanged, there can be no possibility of the souls entering into the transmigratory state, for the parts of an inert stone cannot move nor can a frog be confined within it. If the soul be different from Brahman, it must be either atomic or all-pervasive or of an intermediate size. If it be all-pervasive, there can be no traveling. If it be of a medium size, indeterminate size changing with the body, it will become impermanent. If it be atomic, any feeling of sensation all over the body will be inexplicable. Besides, the views about the atomic and medium sizes were previously refuted under the aphorism 2.3.29 in an elaborate way. If the soul be different from the Supreme Brahman, such scriptural declarations as that thou art, Chandogya 6.8.7, will be nullified. This defect is equally in evidence even if the soul be either a transformation or a part. Opponent Since the source and its modifications and parts are the same, constituting a single whole, no defect arises from these two points of view. Vedantin, not so, because in that case, unity in the primary sense becomes impossible. Besides, from all these points of view, there arises the predicament of liberation being entirely ruled out, owing to the non-eradication of the notion of the identity of the soul with its transmigratory state. Or even if that identity should cease, the soul will lose its innate nature by merging in Brahman, since its identity with Brahman is denied by the opponent. There are some people who prattle thus. The obligatory and occasional rites are performed for the sake of avoiding evil, The optional and prohibited rites are given up for avoiding heaven and hell, and the results of works which are to be experienced in the present body get exhausted by experiencing them, so that when the present body falls, at the same time that there is nothing to connect the soul with a fresh body, a man who proceeds in this way will achieve liberation, consisting in the continuance of his own real natural state, even without having realized the unity of the individual self with Brahman. This is not correct, on account of the absence of any valid evidence, for it is not established by any scripture that a man wanting liberation should act thus. This is a position born out of one's own intellectual cognition only, that the transmigratory state is a creation of rights so that it can cease to exist in the absence of these rights. This, again, is not even a matter for inferential reasoning, inasmuch as the absence of the causes of the transmigratory state is beyond such determination. There may be many results of works accumulated in past lives by each creature, which have good or bad fruits in store for them. But since they cannot be experienced simultaneously, owing to their results being opposed to one another, some of them which get a suitable opportunity produce this life, while others wait for the adequate time, space, and cause. And since these remaining ones cannot be exhausted by the experiences in the present life, it cannot be asserted that, after the fall of the present body, a man will get freed from the causes calculated to produce fresh bodies, even though he has followed the course of life described earlier by the opponent. 
that the results of past works persist even after death is proved on the authority of such Upanishadic and Smriti texts as those who perform virtuous deeds here obtain excellent birth. Chandogya 5.10.7 with the residual results of these. Opponent It may well be that the obligatory and occasional duties will eject them, that is, the residual results. Vedantin That cannot be because there is no opposition between them. In a case of opposition alone can something be ejected by something else. But the accumulated virtues of past lives are not antagonistic to the obligatory and occasional duties, since both are equally meant for purification. As for the vices, they may be ejected when they stand in opposition, for they are impure by nature. But that does not prove the absence of the causes of rebirth, since the virtues can well constitute such a cause, and since the vices even are not known to be totally eliminated. Besides, there is no proof to show that the performance of the obligatory and occasional duties produce no other result apart from hindering the emergence of evil, for it is quite possible that a concomitant byproduct will come into being, as Apastamba mentioned in his Smriti, just as when a mango tree is planted for its fruits, its shade and sweet aroma are produced as byproducts, so also when virtuous deeds are done, other factors come out as byproducts. Moreover, until complete enlightenment comes, nobody can make a promise of remaining totally free from the optional and prohibited acts in the period between birth and death, for subtle lapses are noticed in the cases of the most careful men. Maybe all this will be considered a doubtful contingency. Even so, it becomes difficult to be convinced that no cause for rebirth remains. Besides, unless it is admitted that the soul's identity with Brahman is a truism realizable through knowledge, it is idle to expect liberation for a soul which is believed to be an agent and an experiencer by nature, for one's nature can never be given up like heat by fire. Namaste. So, this continues from the previous video, the arguments against the misunderstandings of the opponent. The opponent tries to say that, well, the soul is a part of Brahman. So, if one just does nothing, <laughs> stops performing actions and so on, by eliminating the karma, the residual karma, prarabdha karma and so on, then he will automatically attain liberation. Duh. <laughs> this is nonsense. Because if the soul is a part of Brahman, you know, e even if we accept the nonsense argument <laughs> that the soul is part of Brahman, even though Brahman has no parts, then where is it going to go? Just like you can't say that the pot is a part of the clay and when the pot is broken, then it goes back into the earth. No, it was always part of the earth. It was always clay. And in the same way, the soul, the individual living being, is always Brahman. There's nothing else that it could be. Because, why? It's conscious and self-aware, sentient in a word. So, because the soul is sentient, automatically means it is already Brahman. Huh? Just like the pot is already clay, it's already earth. See, it is, it's nature. And so you can't separate the nature from the thing itself, just like you can't separate heat from fire or spaciousness from space. <laughs> you know, that's what it is. So all these arguments are, you know, wrongly conceived. In fact, they are just a product of, as he says, mental cogitation. These 
pundits, so-called pundits, like to agitate their minds, you know, just like a churning butter, right? You have to agitate it. And then this precipitates the colloidal suspension and you get butter. So in the same way, they agitate their minds and out come all of these spacious arguments. <laughs> but they don't hold water because they are not considering the actual nature either of Brahman or of the soul. See, this is why the only really correct view is reflection and superimposition. That consciousness, awareness, and so on are properties of Brahman reflected in the body and mind. The body and mind do not have these qualities naturally. They come from somewhere else. And looking in the opposite way, Brahman being all there is, is covered by the body and mind as upadis. So covering and reflection, these are the correct views. And all these other views are just nonsense. So just like the pot doesn't have to go anywhere to be clay, <laughs> it's already clay. The soul does not have to go anywhere to become Brahman. Therefore, Brahman is always attained. In fact, the very idea or expression of attaining Brahman or going to Brahman is nonsense. Because we're already there. Brahman is all-pervading. And it is everything that is. Because it is existence itself. And that existence is simply reflected by all these apparent different objects in the material world. So there is no going anywhere. <laughs> Except now, if you want to attain the secondary Brahman, the qualitative Brahman or conditioned Brahman, then you have to go somewhere. Because this earthly world is not a fit place for a realized being exactly because of the coverings and reflections of the body and mind. So one has to go to a world which is of different constitution, of different nature. And in that way, the qualities of the realized being can be manifested in a natural way. Actually, one realizes Brahman in this world as a kind of unnatural thing. Huh? Nature by itself will never give the clue that actually you are Brahman. Actually, the soul is omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. Because in nature we apparently see all these different beings, different objects with different qualities. And, of course, the body and mind by itself is neither conscious nor active. It is only so when the presence of the soul is reflected in it. So these are the secrets. Huh? These, this is the knowledge, like we were talking about last time, the absolute knowledge that we are already Brahman. We have always been Brahman. We will always be Brahman. So there's no need to go anywhere or attain anything or transform or what else could it be? Develop a consciousness of Brahman or something like that. There are all these nonsense theories floating around. And even since the time of Shankaracharya, they have come up with more. <laughs> So, we have to understand, we have to be very well grounded in the basics of what is Brahman, what is the soul, and what is the nature, the position of the being in the world and out of the world. 
And then these arguments will have no effect on us. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.